I'll, this I'll is, send you the link. <laughs> this is the OGM call for Thursday, October 31st, 2024. And I'm going to say what I just said just to get it on the recording. I mean, if I knew that Dave Gray had a line of t-shirts with clever drawings on them <laughs> that was available for purchase online, I would very likely go get a couple myself and get a couple for friends. <laughs> the problem is, Dave, we don't know they exist. I will put them in the chat. How's that? I promise. I, I think that's okay. a genius idea. <laughs> I think that's a total genius idea. I mean, t-shirts available during the Christmas season? What I don't know. Idea. What a thought that would be. <laughs> yeah, go consider that just for a second. Yeah, t-shirts from somebody who can encapsulate a lot of ideas into a simple drawing that's very appealing. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. That doesn't sound right. There's something just off about this. <clears throat> anyway, welcome, everybody. This is, it, it occurred to me, I think I'm making a little bit of a line of scrimmage call. I'll see what, how you all feel, but this would be Halloween. And it seems like a very appropriate day because we are uh, five days away from uh, at least the event of the election of 2024, the US uh, presidential and many other elections being held. And we may not know the results of the presidential election for several days or who knows. But the thing will be over and we will have some feeling for where things stand, uh, I think, the next day. If, if everything is razor thin, we'll know that. Um, and so I thought maybe we could use this call, uh, which is still in line of governance, but to, to think, about, uh, think about the election, uh, our own reactions to them. Uh, there was a nice article recently about how to cope with election anxiety, which I will repost a gift link to in the chat. Uh, but I thought maybe we'd go there for a little bit because this is the last call we will, the last OGM call for all eternity in the old regime, meaning post uh, November 5, 2024. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic about the role of election day this year, but it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. Um, and if, and if your advice to me is, Hey, take a chill pill, and uh, this is not such a big deal, I'd love to hear that as well. Um, so why don't we start with a little bit of that and just see what's, uh, what's, in, people's, what's in people's hearts and minds are around the, uh, the upcoming election. Whoever would like to step in, please step. I'll, I'll go real quick. Um... I, I heard this from somebody on, on this call. I don't want to out this person unless they want to be outed. But we signed off from a, a lovely call about other stuff with uh, you know a little bit of talk about the election. And he said, brought to you by the entertainment division of the military industrial complex. And it just cracked me up. Um, so go ahead and say who you are if, if you want to or, or, or not. I did or it. Forever. I'm sorry. <laughs> It, it made my day, uh, Sam. <laughs> it makes my day uh, every time I think it. <laughs> and I don't want to live in a world where that's the punchline, but if you gotta if you gotta live in this world, at least a little levity <laughs> helps. Exactly. Um, with less lev, but same trope, I've got a half written post that basically says this is not democracy. Uh, that we, you know, two and a half years of campaigning, uh, several billion dollars worth of money spent poured into the media apparatus uh, to advertise to us. And one, so uh, this is a thesis I'd love to investigate somehow. I don't know how, I don't know if, who's done research on this, but there's lots of, there's a lot of conjecturing going on about why this is a 50-50 razor thin election. Uh, what's up? And one of my guesses is that Citizens United basically uncapped uh, the pouring of money on top of campaigns. And if you pour really big amounts of money into both sides of a campaign, the, the result winds up being like in the middle, regardless what the campaigns are saying or doing, it seems. I, like, I may be completely off, but it seems like the influence of the money on campaigns, much though I hate it, and much though I think that advertising uh, subverts the human mind in different ways and, and, and so forth, um, it feels to me like that's possibly one of the things that's going on. Um, I don't, anybody feel negatively about that or strongly about that? I, yeah. I don't know about um, money in this particular sense, but 
it's incredible the sophistication on both on the on not not so much on the democratic side but the sophistication and i think musk brought this in i mean i just have an exchange on the sewer club national server the national grassroots network and they're all excited because trump announced that he would appoint kennedy to be in charge of agriculture right and, and so i'm saying do you really or health or health and, and for health yeah and i'm saying do you really want to believe this oh yeah we believe this and i said why wouldn't mm -hmm. you then also believe all the other stuff he has been saying like the, like uh shipping out millions of people and you know all this other crazy stuff he plans to do and, and so so these are these are activists right environmental activists who all of a sudden feel captured you know by by this idea and that really floored me you know i would have not expected that thanks klaus sam yeah just to write along with what klaus is saying you know um if you look at uh trump's like uh history you know he's just he's just a sort of ruthless sort of business guy who loves glamour and you know and and fame and and like that's my opinion of him but and you know he knows mergers and acquisitions you know and he's like managed to kind of like merger and acquisition you know kennedy and and um musk and um you know and tulsi gabbard and like but so but i, I think it kind of all comes down to this which is that the um you know in 2016 we had there was this there was this um progressive there was this um populist movement or this like anti-establishment movement that the the united the people of the united states were feeling and the republicans sort of put their wing put their chariot they they let you know they they yoked it with trump and the dems um crushed it with bernie you know they destroyed it and so we're kind of getting the point here for me is that there's this upswelling of people who, you know, look at the statistics of in fact of uh, chronic disease in the United States and the environmental pollution and the and the you know the the concern with the the climate and the you know and, and genetic modification and you know uh, all of these things, and they just see business as usual, business as usual, business as usual. As much as I love, I think Kamala's you know like has comes from the right background and all that stuff but she's still a winner in a in a rigged system you know and she's had to play the game and everybody recognizes that um you know for some reason trump is able to kind of put blinders he's playing the game too you know he's he's a winner at that game as well and so none of these are good options but uh, you know it's like at least he's kind of like playing to the the he's he's properly hearing the concern of a lot of people in the United States about that. And like he's saying, hey, I'm going to put these people in who are outsiders, who are, you know, have uh, ortho uh, heter heterodoxy positions like Kennedy. And, um, you know, and so, you know, w whether he actually um, adapts any of Kennedy's policies once he's in office, he's he's a he's a snake snake man you know so it would be hard to say but if he if he does if he does any of it then it will be an actual um manifestation of this disruption of the business as usual of politics you know and so i i can't vote for him because i find him repulsive but um you know as a human being i mean um as far as you know, the environment and women's health, and you know, getting out of the Paris Accords and blah blah, blah you know, all that stuff. Come on, you know, like it's crazy. It's crazy talk, but um, you know, but um, but there's this little little sliding in of like, but you know, we're gonna disrupt business as usual. Like we're not gonna because I'm sure if if Harris gets in there, business as usual will continue. That's my impression. And, you know, she's an insider in an, in a group of people that is run by people like, you know, the Biden administration was run when he wasn't actually functioning. It was run by advisors like Avril Haynes. Do you guys know who that is? Avril Haynes is, is um, who's that guy um, in the Nixon era? Um, she's, she's a war hawk, you know, she's like a... Um, 
what do we say? Military industrial complex. She's like, you know, um, Henry Kissinger. She's a Dick Cheney, you know, and she's in the circle of who was managing Biden's administrative, you know, function while um, he was, you know, uh, suffering. So, so there, that, there's that voice of like, hey, you know, we need somebody outside of these these well-oiled channels, you know, to to actually disrupt and make a change. And so I, I totally get why people feel some hope around Trump, you know, because the Dems, I'm sorry, you're not doing it, you know, you're not doing it for people. You sound like business as usual. You sound like corporate interests. You look like it and you sound like it. So that's, you know, I'm still voting for her, but, you know, anyway. Uh, thanks, Sam. You're reminding me of some videos I posted online after the 2020 election about Trump. Uh, I did a, it's a playlist of six videos that um, might be useful and interesting, might be a little too late to be useful. Gil, and I know Gil, you've only got, uh, we're, you're in a car and you're with us for the first half hour only, I think today. I, I am, and it's, and nothing's too late to be useful. This thing's not over till uh, late on Tuesday. Uh, there's a lot of work being done, uh, phone banking, get out the vote work. And so um, time is better spent making phone calls than trying to handicap the election. Um, uh, two comments, Jerry. One is I'm huh, I was sitting here laughing as you were talking about, gee, wonder if maybe Citizens United maybe has something to do with how fucked up things are. Maybe I wonder. Uh, I, I was surprised at how tentative you were about that because it's clearly um, had a massive effect on American politics. Um, the other thing, right, you know, you talk about spending two and a half years and billions of dollars on this election. In France, the presidential elections are limited by law to six weeks. That's all. Yeah. Uh, the, the question I ask people is, do you know, who, who know, who knows how much time passed between when Rishi Sunak called a snap election and when he had to move out of 10 Downing Street? Yeah. What's the answer? You should know this for trivia contests later. It's like it's like weeks, wasn't it? Forty-four days. Yeah, forty-four days between he calls for some misguided reason a snap election, and yeah. the evening of the election he concedes. The next morning, Starmer is moving into Ten Downing, which is yeah. like we have an election, and then like <clears throat> there's an inauguration way down the road. We we seem really stodgy in comparison. Anyway, well, the, uh, rhythm, the the rhythm was set up when people traveled by horse. Uh, it doesn't, but that's a while ago. I mean, it, you know, yeah, it was, but that's what it says in the Constitution. Right. Um, and then the whole story about when, after Lincoln was elected, how he got to D.C. is a fascinating story of history, by the way. And he, he, he was almost assassinated in Boston. Uh, Pink uh, Pinkerton was his bodyguard, uh, hence Pinkertons later, et cetera, et cetera. My hesitation, Gil, was not that Citizens United has had an effect, which it clearly has. It was really yeah. about my more extreme thesis that to hell with content, to hell with uh, what everybody's saying, when you pour equal money on both sides, that might actually always screw things up. And, yeah. I, and I, I would love yeah. to see if anybody is studying that. So it wasn't, I, I think Citizens United is one of multiple terrible decisions that SCOTUS has made recently. There's a, uh, there's a thought in my brain titled shameful SCOTUS cases. <laughs> um, a big one, a big thought. A, uh, like presidential immunity is in there. Oh God. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Stacy. I'm not sure I can transition. Oh, sorry. Uh, take a moment. Take a beat. <laughs> I'm just, uh, I'm at the end of my rope today. Like I actually told somebody that, that I know I came straight out and I said, yes, I actually think you are a horrible person. And I will happily say that to your face. You have always been a horrible person. This is not about politics. Please stop tagging me. And I thought about it. And then I went back and I was like, should I just delete that? And I'm like, no, that's how I feel. That's how I feel. And I'm just like done with pretending something other than that. And she happens to be a horrible person. And I would not be surprised if there's like swath stickers in her house. And I'm, you know, I'm not just saying that, you know, I, I live in an area where we had Nazi camps less than 50 years ago here. So, you know, these values do pass down through families. Um, 
Yesterday, I got a very nice private message from somebody who said, you know, I don't know you, but I really commend you for what you're doing. And I want you to know that it's appreciated because I spend time in this one particular group getting like beat down. But now people are starting to speak up more. But what I wanted to say is that part of the problem, especially when it comes to individuals, not it, 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 it has to do with that. Um, it's almost like some people don't have the ability to understand nuance. And so, yeah, all this information coming in and flooding everything doesn't leave room for discussions that separate out different things. So, for example, in this one group, I try to isolate the people that are vote, you know, like maybe they're a Trump supporter or they, they don't like him, but they said something similar to what Sam says. And then when they say, well, we don't have to worry about, you know, democracy, you know, we have guardrails in place. I let them see the people in the group that are agreeing there should be one year mandatory jail time for flag burning. Because if these conversations don't come, you know, the problem isn't just what's happening in government. It's the support on the ground that individuals give to these horrible things. So I don't know where I'm going with this, other than I think that all of us are going through a lot of emotional stuff and it has to spill out somewhere. And I'm not saying I know what the answer is, but there's a lot going on. And yeah, I just feel better now that I got it off my chest. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Um, maybe, a, maybe a tiny note. You talked early on about Nazi camps we had 50 years ago. To me, there's a there's a pretty big difference between internment camps and extermination camps. And when when somebody said like in, like the British had internment camp. camps, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I meant just I meant strongholds where they held meetings. Communities That's fine. Is what the, I meant. So so yeah, Nazi plotting in the U.S. Thank definitely, you. definitely happening. Good. Thank uh, you. Thank, thank you. Because you said Nazi camps here, and I'm like, mm, there's a there's yeah, a bit I didn't of mean a that. Sorry, thank <clears> you. bit of a gap there. Thanks. Well, they're Nazi summer camps is what you're talking about, right? Like okay. uh, that's, a, that's a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the American Bund basically back in the day uh, was the, the, the Nazi party. America first comes from them, which is the, the tagline that that uh, alongside MAGA Trump has picked up. So it's the history here is is really like Jer amazingly explicit in so many ways. Jer Jerry, can I just jump in for a quick second? Sorry to jump the line uh, regarding the American the the America first. Um, um, uh, what is it? Fresh Air yesterday had an hour long piece on America First and the America First agenda, uh, which is parallel to and different and maybe more extreme than the Project 2025 agenda. I really encourage people to take a listen to it. Super. Thank you. Yeah. Um, really appreciate that. Sam. So I think we're getting lost in the weeds, and I want to explain why I feel that way. Um, and so there's this concept of legitimacy um, of the governed, and it has to do with, you know, when there's this division, um, like there's a small group of people making decisions for a large group of people, and maybe half or 49% of them disagree with the solutions that are being, that have come up with, um, you know, it's like you get into the situation where there's, um, there's this like tension of civil war, you know, the, the, this, you know, this, um, like, revolution in the air, you know, and like, we're, we're really at that phase. And, and it's because our process doesn't feel legitimate to most people. So you have uh, uh, people who are elected as representatives, you know, if there's five people running, you could win with 21%, you know, of the vote. And, um, and so, you know, people's voices are not really being represented. And, and nobody feels like, their representatives really represent them, and in position. And when you have this kind of a situation where you have majority rule or plurality vote, like like I'm describing, then um, you, you know, it's it's just you know it, it's really impossible to have people who actually represent the, the the needs of the people, and they end up representing their donors. I mean, that, I mean, every and everybody knows that's true. Everybody feels that's true. So, like we're we're in the situation where we're um, constantly 
going back and forth and like, you know, one group is undoing the work of the other one for four years. And then the next, you know, and, and we just go back and forth and we can't actually do anything. Um, and we get so caught up in it. We get so worked up in it and we fail to see because we don't have a good sense making apparatus. We fail to see the why 49% of the people feel that way. And we end up being so offended and so like hurt and destroyed by these different, uh, you know, op opinions. And, 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 you know, and like, I mean, I get it, you know, you identify with the environment, you identify as a woman, or you identify as, you know, someone whose country is, is going down economically and, you know, and, and, you know, the, these people are, are hobbling our best minds or, you know, however you identify, um, we, we, you know, we just don't, we, we've created, we have an environment where we can't integrate, we can't synthesize the, the different opinions. And, and in fact, we become intolerable to each other. You know, we become like, um, unable to tolerate different opinions, unable to like identify, um, with, you know, and understand the perspectives of other people and have sense, sensible conversations, like have productive conversations. I mean, that's, that's really what, I'm trying to build here with this software and, 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 you know, and, and this polis, I just had a meeting with John Warner just before this call where we, the, the, the thing was that we did was we listed all the stakeholders for the Walla Walla water basin and the farmers, the fisher, you know, the native fishermen, the, the city dwellers with their little gardens and their, the regulators and the, you know, and we wrote down um, a few statements that would resonate with each of those groups. And we put all of those in there into the polis, you know, like nobody's doing this, you know, like there's no there are, adults there are in the room. Group, there are a few groups doing this. They're just getting no attention. Right. The, right. the attention yeah. is entirely on the horse race and everything else. But there are groups that have been working on this for decades. It's of course you're right. Of course you are. But it's like there's there's no adults in the room that matters. You know, with the, the room with the power, there's no adults there. And we we enable that through our complicity and, and through our like focusing here, we are focusing on the horse race again, when we should be focusing on something that could actually solve the problem. We which is what know. a string of calls has been about. Which I is, know. I know. I'm just being, I, 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 there's, there's a little irony there, but <laughs> <laughs> I know, but we're back on the track. No, and I, and I get it. I mean, I get it because there are things at stake, but it's just, you know, from my perspective, you know, I'm just, I'm just, so done with the horse race i'm younger than most of the people here and i'm done with it you know i'm just done with it and like um because i can promise you like i don't think i can't promise you but my very strong feeling is that this 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 system is so entrenched and so um bought and sold and um and that you know say we had a giant blue wave and you know all the democrats got voted in everywhere you know, for the next 10 years, would it really solve the problem? I don't think so. That's my opinion. I don't think it would. Firstly, you'd have the legitimacy problem. You'd have all of the people who have different opinions being treated as deplorables and intolerables. And, you know, and you'd have these like half-baked solutions because truth is there are opinions outside of the Democratic Party that are of value. There really are. I'm sorry. You know, there are ways of approaching things that don't kind of pop up in the average democratic mind and you know that's the reality so so anyway here we are we're talking about it and this is just going to be and then four years there'll be another one four years there'll be another one it'll be oh existential crisis again that's you know and meanwhile we're tottering towards environmental collapse and blah 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 so for me the, the thing is like what's a solution that could actually work you know that's that's the conversation i want to have um, so I'm throwing my, again, my asshole three cents into the ring here, but talk, uh, talk amongst yourselves, please. I, I, I think we're very on board with what solution that would actually work. I, I think we'll, the, uh, one place we haven't, first, we haven't succeeded yet in building a stack of things we would recommend. Like if somebody made us, you know, monarch tomorrow, what would we institute to reinstate democracy that works? Uh, we don't know yet. We don't have that. But the, then the second thing is to create some kind of uh to, to to plot and scheme and create some kind of plan that makes that the actual thing that works and we don't have that so uh, i think there's plenty of plenty of room for us to to figure this out somehow um klaus 
Yeah, so I'm I'm totally uh, uh, in tune here with what Sam is saying, because as we speak, there's actually the, a risk that the uh, the uh, ocean currents are overturning, which would have absolutely catastrophic impacts, uh, and the window of influencing that is really shrinking rapidly, um, and the the amazing. Um, uh, reality is that you, we we still have uh, elements within the society. No, the, the, um, I call it maybe status quo capital, or no, ex, uh, the the uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, systems that have been in place for a long time. <laughs> I can't the word, in, but... Incumbents, the the. In... Yeah, you know what? Yeah. The, so Powers that be deep state. <laughs> no, man, no, man. I don't mean I don't mean that. But it's just it's just people who have money invested. I mean, you, for example, you're trying to get out of biofuels, then you realize that billions of dollars invested in, you know, in the existing capacity uh, legacy system is what I meant to say. Oh, so, class. so so you can't you can't get out of it, and the political process is completely captured. So the reason why. People within the Sierra Club feel all of a sudden uh, that uh, let's go with Trump because he's bringing in Kennedy and Kennedy is, is having the right ideas is because they're desperate. Because people in, 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 that, in that environment realize the, the, the incredible risk that we're at, you know, the, the environmental deterioration. They're constantly, I mean, when I, I'm on, on this uh, national grassroots network, I'm on the leadership team there. And, and there, you constantly get alarming reports about you now water and uh, pollution and chemicals and what have you. So, uh, and the, the Democrats really don't have a compelling message where that would say, "Look, well, we're going to fix this." You know, it's all you know very gradual. So then you go and talk with people who, uh, I, I mean, while I was traveling, I encountered some people from Texas. And they said, oh, yeah, these storms, you know, it's just bring it on. We are from Texas. You know, we can handle this stuff. And, and so, so you have this, this uh, ignorance in the, in the population, or this willful denial of reality. And when you, I don't know if, if you have listened into uh, to uh, Yuval Harari, but he's like on a, on a major kick, you know, we can split the atom, but we can't distinguish truth. Our information is failing us. So... Ferrari, in his latest book, uh, Nexus, uh, is really coming, is trying to explain that uh, our problem is not our ethics or that we are inherently bad people or all of those things. Our problem is that the information we are consuming is tainted and, and willfully manipulated. And that's literally like taking a computer program and jamming it on purpose. Yeah? And so we are allowing that to happen. And so to be, we are now becoming conscious and aware. My God, we have been aware of it since Shakespeare and basically since Plato. You know, we, we have known that uh, messing with with stories is messing up the political process. It's messing up people's understanding of reality. We don't have a shared reality, but by design and by purpose. So, so that's why I'm so focused on communications theory. And on on uh, you know, how do you overcome these barriers, and how do you uh, sort of subvert these these uh, manipulative messages uh, uh, in in ways that is uh, that is uh, non nonviolent? What you, I mean, it's it's uh, hopeful. You know, how do you how do you get through uh, to people to to understand, to, to understand, this is you know, a, a a reality that we all share, and so it's really interesting because Harari has basically come to come to the point is we know how to program computers, right? The way we function is exactly the same thing. Our software is stories, yeah, and and so so the the uh, uh, and we we are completely acting, reacting based on the stories that form our our understanding of reality. It's the filters, the lens 
through which we see the world around us and interpret the world around us. Right? So that's, I think, is where we could focus on and make an impact and make a difference. Right? That's, it's there. You know, so so where, how do you, so it's like with the Sierra Club, uh, my response was, so if you want to believe this, why don't you also believe everything else he says? And I posted the New Yorker Times article where, which is uh, believe him, right? I mean, they, they listen like 20 things he said, believe him. So I posted this. If you want to believe this, why would you not believe that? You know, so, so the, the, it's not an argument. It's not, you know, it's, it's not uh, getting into any uh, equation. It's just simply you know, chuckling minds in ways that uh, trips, you know, uh, 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 create some cognitive dissonance there. So anyway, I think that's really where uh, we, we may want to push our energy and our focus. You know? Sorry, I muted myself in order to not play that video for everybody. Um, Klaus, uh, thank you. And I had not seen that video by Harari. And it strikes me that what he might be saying in that video is extremely ogm -y and is right on right on task for us. I mean, um, so I, I, I will go listen to it and see what it brings back to our calls. Mike. Um, I'm going to apologize. I, I'm going to have to drop off periodically, and, and I, I will maybe be back in about uh, 45 minutes, but it's uh, 11.30 here and I have a quick lunch to go to. Um, but I, I'm so glad both for Sam's comments, which were a lot more than three cents, that's, that's at least $30,000, um, because we really do have to somehow find ways to build consensus preferably online asynchronously and remotely, but that's a, a big order. And Klaus nailed the other point I wanted to make, which is that we're in swimming in this flood of, of disinformation. I mean, I, 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 I was surprised to learn that um, all these stories about J.D. Vance and the couch was completely fabricated and there was no... Nothing he had ever written referred to that, but um, and and I'm pretty astute on this. I, I, I luckily had not retweeted any of the memes, the countless memes that were generated by one jerk uh, posting something on TikTok. But I, I I I'm I'm looking for a little bit of psychological help on how to. <laughs> deal with whatever happens on Tuesday. I mean, I, it's probably not going to be until Friday or Saturday that we have any good sense of what's going on. But there's a whole lot of people here in Washington who are just losing a, uh, losing a lot of sleep and, and not knowing how to feel they're doing enough. Uh, and because it's just you're up against this incredible tsunami of disinformation. And um, as someone said, billions of dollars Luckily, it looks like Harris is spending the dollars much more wisely than Trump. Trump's whole campaign, well, most of his campaign is about telling people that the election's a sham and that you shouldn't trust whatever happens. Um, and that's that's very disturbing. I'm also just very anxious about what could happen if we see some more uh, disruption of the mail-in voting process. We saw the ballot drop boxes lit on fire. Um, it would just take a few crazy people deciding to shoot up a long line outside of a voting location to really, really, really change the voting behavior. And particularly if it's uh, in those areas that have long lines, which tend to be urban areas, which tend to be democratic. The other last thought, as I've, I've been trying to just pull together the pieces, and, and I, I, I feel I'm living through history, and I, I have for the last three or four months, um, starting with Biden stepping down, and I, I'm just trying to understand what's going on. I, I posted one little puzzle piece that I found just this morning uh, from Professor Galway, and it was a chart showing 
who owns what in America by age group. And what's stunning is the amount of wealth owned by people over 45 has gone from 55% to 75% in 20 years. Now, older people are always going to be wealthier, but this incredible drop in the wealth that people between the ages of 35 and 45 have, you know, the, the people who um, should be in their peak earning years is, is horrifying. And, and this is driving so much of the feeling of inequality and, and resentment. Um, everybody in that age group knows that their parents and their grandparents are sitting on large amounts of money, have a nice house, and they don't have that and don't see prospects of getting it. So I, 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 I hope somebody kind of puts the pieces together at some point but I know that the two pieces we already mentioned, which is the inability of people with different opinions to even discuss those opinions, and this flood of totally bogus information constantly distracting us uh, is, is a big part of it. But I'm I'm hoping and praying. I'm, I'm, I, I was gonna be in Canada on election night and my wife informed me that that is unacceptable. Oh, wow. <laughs> I needed to be back here for uh, in case she needs a hug and I need a hug. But anyway, Sounds like a good call. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's a good call. But it would it would have been interesting to see the Canadian reaction to what goes on here. But I'm sure I'll hear a lot uh, from the Canadians who have a front row seat. Thank you for letting me wander, and uh, and I do again apologize for having to leave a little early. I'll I'll stay online and uh, look forward to reading the. The chat and and listening to the full talk later. This has been a, a fascinating series of discussions about a topic I really care about. Here at the Carnegie Endowment, we have a whole team looking at statecraft and the future of democracy and the breakdown of democracy around the world. And unfortunately, very few of these hopeful stories, a lot of prototypes and just a few places where they've actually made political decisions in a new way that uh, because doing something new, whether it's collaborative consensus building, that, that implies somebody's giving up power. And we haven't found a way to do that. Um, Mike, if you can think of any CEIP folks who would make a good guest here to bring some, of, some ideas that would be generative in our discussions on this topic, please let me know and let's invite them because I, I really would love to bring people who've thought deeply about this and have you know, roles in figuring this out. In the public you know, we had that conversation three months ago and I gave you some names of the people and I reached out to the people I yeah. consider most likely to help. And they said, oh, my God, we are totally saturated. Now, not just because of the U.S. election, yeah. which has been their focus, but Moldovan election, Georgian election, French election. I mean, they, they there's a lot going on, but they did express a desire to give us an update and. And maybe they'll pull all these pieces together and either in a paper or a talk, um, give us some sense of where we are and where we might go. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. I appreciate that. Stacy, please. Yeah. Um, so I, I just want to say that what I'm going to say, I think, would land differently if I were like in a call with a lot of women. But the question that I have is why? Are we so willing to support untrustworthy leaders? And why are we so willing to win at all costs? And when I say we, I mean those people that are, because <laughs> I'm not. But um, I think there is like a some sort of di male-female dynamic going on there. And I also want to say, am I the only one that notices that in the Democratic Party, there's been a rise to the top of many women that I don't see in the Republican Party? And that's it. <laughs> Something to think about. Um, thanks, Stacey. Uh, the trust question is really weird um, because the videos that I mentioned that I forgot to put the, 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 the link to in the chat yet, 
Um, Donald Trump, I'm going to say something you're going to hate, is trustworthy. Uh, one of the interesting simple models of trust is the separation between cognitive trust and affective trust. Cognitive trust is, do I think they're going to carry out the promises or threats they're going to do? And do I think they're actually going to achieve them? Affective trust is, do I like them? And do I think they have my best interests at heart? Donald Trump fits this. People might absolutely hate him and despise him, but he, he is threatening to do things that some people appear to want to do, and they think he's going to at least try to carry them out. One of those threats is to destroy the, the broken system. The system is rigged. And that's a promise that, you know, um, I think had helped him win in 2016. So in a very, very odd way, uh, and then there's a bunch of things the Democrats say and do that don't actually play out well. Uh, there's performative progressives is a, is a term that I've been hearing more than I want, which is uh, progressives who say, oh, this is really important, but then nothing happens. So that means that you can't trust them cognitively to carry out the thing they say, say, say they really want because it doesn't actually happen. So the, there's, uh, the trust thing is really complicated and juicy and interesting, but but I don't, I don't know, and I hate saying this, I don't know that Donald Trump is untrustworthy. I and, just and, want to say real quick though, that yeah. part of the reason that some people believe him it's not that they believe him or trust him. It's that they're so hateful and distrustful of the system. And so they don't believe any of those things. Right. But but they trust his assaults on the system because he's saying the system is as, as hateable as you say it is, people. Uh, that he, He's echoing this. So so it's, it's, it's really complicated, Stacey. I, and I'm not even just talking about Donald Trump. Take something, take somebody like RFK Jr., I yeah. mean, where his whole family is warning against him. We know the guy's a narcissist. We, I mean, if you've read any of the exposés about him, he's not the most trustworthy source. You know, maybe his female partner is somebody I would follow, but not him. Yeah. But she's Thanks. following him, right? So and that's right. Dave, go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, and I I was trying to I can't even quite figure out where to, to jump into this conversation, but but I have lots of thoughts about it. Um I mean, one of the things I've been wondering about, so I, did, I talked a little bit last week about the Join or Die documentary. I don't know if anybody's watched that, but it's the building on the Bob Putnam stuff around bowling alone. And, you know, kind of part of the argument is that, you know, they had the bowling alone books, what, 30 years old or something like that. But the tendencies to lose social capital have continued, right? We've continued to see the drop off in interconnectedness and societal tensile strength. Um, and and one of, I did a, a little bit of door knocking in Las Vegas last uh, last week, and um, I ran into. I was mostly knocking on the doors of Dems, but I ran into one person who was independent and one person who was strong Trump. They were both young women, which was a little bit disconcerting. And um, and and I, I I didn't really engage in conversation, but but my experience trying to engage in conversation has been that you'll say why, and they'll say some reason, like the the undecided person said it's my pocketbook my electric bill went up 200 bucks but you know if you push very far there really isn't a policy it isn't it isn't a logical thing i i i think it's a tribal thing it's a it's an emotional thing and we keep trying to treat it as a logical thing but it's not and then it's it's like a football allegiance or something like that and and that's you know like you're walking around the neighborhood and there might there were a couple of you know it's mostly a democratic neighborhood Couple walls, uh, uh, Harris Wall signs, not very many. Big Trump displays, big letters and flags, and you know, there's it's it's just a very different kind of emotional membership kind of thing, and it reinforces to me this this thing that one of the things that's broken is is the connectedness, right? Which maybe us internet-y folks ought to be taking some of the blame for that, and and I wonder in reading through this. Um, seeing like a state thing, he's comparing high modernism, kind of the architecture of urban areas kind of that, that, that we kind of like uh, uh, aesthetically, kind of big plazas and things like that, that, that seem to destroy community to, to Jane Jacobs' model of having uh, awareness on the street. And, and Stacey, you know, he kind of equates it in the book, actually equates it to male and female, right? That Jane, that Jane Jacobs, only Jane Jacobs, only a woman could have written Jane Jacobs' stuff, you know? Uh, which could be true because he, she was seeing the, the 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 community on the streets and in the West Village, and it was that 
it wasn't necessarily that people knew each other, but they were familiar with each other, right? It was the kind of the second degrees of, of connection thing. And I feel like this is one of the wor warnings I would have for, for Sam, you know, is I worry that we're trying to kind of perfect our high modernism, make our democracy tidier, cleaner, smoother, more logical, right? And those male failings are what reinforces the disconnection that leads you to the Trump phenomena, which is an emotional thing, right? And so, right, and I don't know where, you, you know, like a whole bunch of our economy has been to, to perfect things, to clarify things, to simplify things, to accelerate things, right? To make them more efficient, right? And I think all of those decisions kind of cumulatively may be one of the things that lead us to the, uh, lead us to a Trump, a Trump phenomena. And, and, and there is kind of like the, you know, we're the good people trying to do good things. They're the bad people trying to do bad things. And, you know, how do we stop them kind of stuff. And, and I feel like it's got to be more complicated than that, right? There's a lot of things that we thought were good that are turned out to be bad. Um, and and I don't know quite what to do with those things. I was thinking, last last comment I'll make, but, but I was listening to my, uh, my wife's podcast yesterday, uh, interviewing a, a guy talking about health and the election and how health is not a big topic in this year's election, right? But it has been huge in the last couple of presidential elections, right? And like, what happened? And, you know, kind of the conclusion is, well, what happened is the ACA worked, right? And so now that the, the Republicans can't destroy it, they can't attack it, and the Dems, you know, don't have to defend it, and so it's dropped out of the conversation. But the fact that it worked seems like it should matter, right? It was like, here was a policy that was hugely, you know, conflictual, and you know we've been fighting about for 16, 20, 16 years or so, and and uh, it's not like oh you get credit for the policy that works it just disappears from the conversation. And I don't quite know what that you know what that means in our in our politics. It's like you know, running the economy well doesn't get doesn't seem to get you a lot of points somehow. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate your thoughts, Sam. Yeah, yeah, me as well. And there's a lot of things I I want to follow up on there. Um, one is this comment of like um the trump phenomenon and, and it goes back to what stacy was saying about you know male uh, only male appointees like there's this great um theory from integral theory which is um that each new layer is built on the foundation of the previous layer and when a new level of possibility or cognitive capacity or awareness um, emerges you know it transcends the, the previous layer, but it also includes the previous layer. So this idea here um, that we're we're actually monkeys, <laughs> we're primates, okay? And we're like, and you look at all the, almost all of the, there's with the exception of the bonobos, they're, they're all like, there's this um, sort of male dominance. It's, it has to do with force and hierarchy, especially with the tramp chimps, you know, um, but, uh, but with a lot of them and, and monkey groups. Um, you, you you go up to tribalism, and then you've got this idea of the leader, the tr the chief who's going to um, sort of protect us, uh, our interests, and um, defend us, and make decisions that are going to keep the you know the the invader at bay, and you know blah 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 that kind of stuff, you know, and make sure that we have good hunting grounds and blah blah, blah whatever it is, like um, it, it's it's extension of that kind of. Um, <clears throat> Um, of that uh, primate um, patriarchy, I guess you could say. And um, and what we've got, you know, and then you sort of like people that are, um, you know, Trump supporters, like he fits that bill of like the 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 the, the grumpy chimp, you know, the, the grumpy patriarch chimp who's, fuck them, we're going to take their, you know, we're going to kill them and take the trees. And you know what I mean? Like that, it, it just resonates. And unfortunately, that structure lies in all of us, you know, and, um, and I think we have to be really cognizant of the fact that of that fact, like, there's a lot of people who really are, are resonate with that, like tribal, you know, and, and, and it's not that there's something wrong with it. It's just that we have to be realistic about it. And we have to think clearly about it. Um, and the problem also, with, I think, kind of what, what Dave was saying about about trying to perfect a political system, I, I understand, like my mom would say these things like, you know, um, similar things. But but the idea here is like party politics is a tendency that we have and it emerges when there's a system of voting where, um, you know, 
you only get one vote and it and because it's a single choice voting system the thing that you vote for if you don't vote for the winner your your vote means nothing you know when you get into more evolved voting systems that are more mathematically accurate and reasonable like score voting and rank choice voting and approval voting where you can vote on several things not just a single choice um the single choice voting forces you to vote for something that you think is going to win right and so you get that spoiler effect and the lesser of two evils and all the other um anomalies that we are do we're talking about right now and there there's a very strong argument to say that they're a direct result of the actual silly stupid choice that our founding fathers made when they chose the voting system because they didn't know the math and so um um so my point here though is that if we simply had a rank choice or uh, some other voting method um for choosing who's going to represent us um then a lot of the problems that we're facing here with parties would disappear because people could vote with their conscience and they wouldn't be afraid to vote for somebody that didn't have all this mechanism underneath them so and, and sam i would just point out that i agree with you and you come up with a technological solution to what i believe is an emotional problem sure sure i mean you know and and it and it's 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 again i make this case all the time it's like you know the grocery store when they have can rows of candies on your way to the to the you know there's 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 arguments to be made both sides rows of candies on the way to the checkout people buy more candy right and so it's like sometimes there can we can make an argument for a technological solution just don't put the candy by the checkout thing you know or put some you know fruit there or something you know what i mean um and and uh, and of course like it's an emotional problem you know you're tired you're hungry you're getting groceries and you want to go home and and you you know you want and you just see something sweet and but you're going to get it but there's also a technological side which is you're being manipulated by a technological process called aisles you know and um, display cases and stuff yeah and, I, and i'm so, sorry to jump back in again Sam, but but i actually feel like that's part of the issue is that we're our urge to nudge, right? To our tech, we're all technocrats in this room, I'd say. Mike, you're the ch chief technocrat. And and our urge is to nudge society to do things that we want them to do, right? To create a, a technology that will be, make them behave, whether it's look at more ads, right? In on the on the phone or or you know, buy less candy. And and I and I think that uh, that is part of what we're seeing the revolt against, right? that it's like we have a bunch of people out there saying don't nudge me anymore <laughs> you know well and, and indeed and 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 we, can we get back to this like legitimacy thing where you where feel like people feel like they're part of the process and they're not being manipulated and like and and that you know they can make sense of things and you know i just i i, I feel you man i i and what you're saying is 100 percent true from one perspective and the other perspective is it's like from from my perspective is like we've it's 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 like if we don't solve this problem the people who are doing it the way they're doing it are going to keep doing it, you know, and they're going to get better and better at it. And it's like, you know, my parents were hippies and they went back to the land and thought they'd get out of, uh, um, they called it Babylon. I could call it, you know, whatever they want to call it, but we could call it, you know, the being part of the problem, being part of the supply chain, et cetera. And, you know, 50, hundred years later, it's marching on without them. And I just came to the conclusion that no, we have to step in and say, Hey, um, you're eating the entire planet. Half of the, animal biomass is humans and farm animals and you know we're we're uh, the rainforests are diminishing at a rapid level and we have you know technology to create covid and create um you know uh you know people can clone rich people can clone themselves and come on we need some way to um rein this all in in a way that there's a feeling of legitimacy where people can be part of the discussion otherwise it's just a bunch of technocrats telling us what to do and so there are very few solutions that actually have inherent in them a system of engaging with legitimacy where people can feel like they're part of the process and they're um, delegating to people that, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, that they trust and that are aligned and, and, you know, and all those things. One of those is liquid democracy, one of the very few citizens councils, maybe also. So um, and yeah, when, um, when was the last time you went to a city council meeting? Uh, well, I live in the Netherlands, but I said citizens councils. Yeah, city council. Well, when, city when councils. Did you go, different thing. When have you actively participated in the governance of wherever you are being governed? Um, well, I mean, in the community that I grew up in, quite a bit, but um, but not in know, the last in, five years. Well, I've been in the Netherlands. I, I don't. I don't have these privileges. They don't have there. governance there. I don't. I don't speak Dutch, and everything's in Dutch. Yeah, this is my. I don't participate in anything. 
Yeah. I mean, I comment on it. I've come to these meetings, but I don't yeah. actually participate in any of the governance that's going on around me. Yeah. Well, I think local governance is great. I think that it, it's a lot more democratic and there's a lot more potential for engagement, like you're saying. I but that doesn't that, that doesn't stop me from wanting to solve the bigger problem. I feel like Gandhi on local governance. It's a it's a good idea if it happened. <laughs> um something else is going on at the local level that I'm not that crazy about. Uh, Thanks, Sam. Jose? Um, I, I totally agree with uh, with David that um, this is an emotional problem. And it's an emotional problem because I think we sense that things are wrong and we can't put our fingers on it. None of us know how to fix it. No one knows what the problem really is. Yes, it's the fact that we're disconnected. Yes, it's the fact that we're not um, in community anymore. It's the fact that we're not uh, relating and, and in relationship with people anymore. Our own neighbors, most of us don't know, much less people in our community. Um, how do we bind ourselves together again? I don't think it's a math mathematical solution. And even how do we make choices? I don't think that's a mathematical solution. The choice, the choices that we make to put someone in place that's going to play the role of being our leader, to me, I think that time has passed. That, that we as a society when we were a small society, when we were still emulating kingdoms, where we were like, okay, we don't want a king, but let's bring our own king and we'll hire the king, we'll elect the king. I think that kind of made sense. But now when we know that the system is one of manipulation, we, we keep talking about, well, we have more money than the other side, or they have more money than we do. Why does money matter? Money matters because it's manipulative. We're being manipulated. It's not because money matters because it's right or wrong. Money matters absolutely because we're being manipulated. If you've been in a boardroom, you know that what gets out of that boardroom is completely and utterly shaped to, to speak to whatever the audience is that you're speaking to. And if we don't realize that we're, that whenever you get a, a bunch of people sitting down, telling us what we wanna hear, that doesn't work. That will never work. It can't work, not at this scale. And it, it seems to me that the only way that we can move forward is by creating a new system from the bottom up, not to count on the current system serving us better by some, some mechanics or some level of um, changing how we elect somebody. Now that, that's probably very against the grain with you folks, but um, it, I can't see how we do this within the current system. The, the current system is an evolution of, of a system that was worse, but it isn't the right. And trying to fix this system isn't gonna make it work. So say when you say we have to invent a brand new system, I'm unclear that anybody ever invents anything new. We're always building on stuff that exists. And if you sure. buy that premise, then the piece parts of a new system exist on the table mm -hmm. out there somewhere. And mm -hmm. a piece, the, one of the main motivations for me for doing this sequence of calls about governance or self-control or regulation or whatever we want to call it uh, has been that. I think the piece parts are out there. We just need to figure out how to assemble them in a way that is appealing to people, doesn't force anything down their throats, gets them to know each other and bind with each other again, 
recreate civilization, some utopian sort of scenario there. So, well, you don't, you, you don't need to answer with what are the peace parts, but, but I don't know that we're, we need to invent this from whole cloth. I think we need a very different system. I, I agree. And, and when I say invent, we have this mindset that says we need leaders to lead us. And that those leaders um, are going to work from, from our best interests. And what we've realized is from the beginning that the interests have always been of, of the wealthy, of the powerful, uh, of the political class. It's, it, it's always been that way. And it continues to be that way. And so how do we see that, see through this to break this mindset that if we keep thinking that they will serve us, that we're just going to keep empowering them to take advantage of us. And when I say us, I mean the whole of society because we're just supporting something that is manipulating us endlessly. I, I think, to your point, Jerry, that all the pieces are there, um, but they need to be assembled and implemented at a local level and allowed to grow to, to, to create something new. I don't know, even know what that looks like, but it's not what we've got. I'll Thank shut you. Up there. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me pick up on that because Yuval Harari will argue that what we need is a shared reality. And let me just take the example of the healthcare system, you know, to to uh, give give an idea on on how complex uh, this all is. So, for example, um, Trump already announced that he's going to blow up the Affordable Care Act. Um, and he has a concept to replace it with. And J.D. Manns made uh, some statements that indicated that the first thing that will happen is that pre-existing conditions will again be in play, right? So then you go, where, where, where is this thing going on a larger scale? Two thirds of the American healthcare bill is caused by a nutrient deficient diet. These are nutrient related diseases, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, uh, obesity, right? 40% of Americans have two or more conditions, two thirds have at least one. <clears throat> it's completely unpayable, it's unfixable. So you have to, you have to change the, the food system. You, you, you have to get out of these uh, processed foods, you know, chemically tainted foods, the, the uh, industrial food system is literally destroying the environment. Now, think about the moving parts here that you, that you uh, have, right? So the healthcare industry is basically saying, we can't pay for this. This is unpayable. It's un you know, it, it, it won't work. So they have basically two choices. One is to insert food into the equation of healing, right? So, so the, the, you already have hospitals that are now prescribing uh, uh, food uh, as a as medicine, uh, and and there is a there is a trend that uh, is emerging there. You know, Shimon, one of our OGMers, is working on the salutogenic model, meaning the 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 study of health, um, and and getting very engaged with this. There's a clear trend line where insurance companies are looking at this as an option to reduce their cost. So if you have diabetes, no longer are you gonna be uh, uh, hanging on trucks to fix uh, you, you will have to change your diet. Just like, you know, you have to do therapy if you have a hip problem, you have to do diet when you have diabetes or obesity and so on. But then here comes the other thing where um, the food industry, doesn't want to deal with that. Um, the agricultural sector doesn't want to deal with that. So you have the the changes required, you know, to go through this entire system uh, are incredibly complex. Yeah, you know, and there is nothing 
the, the idea to blow it up and start fresh, that's not going to happen, right? I mean, you, you have uh, in the US alone 330 million people hanging on, you know, you need to eat. And so anything has to, it has to shift. So it what what we do need in, in, in form of a shared reality, and this is like the theory you model, is you have to you have to have a crystallization of uh, we understand the issue, we understand the problem, we have a shared understanding of outcome, and we're starting to prototype how to move from here to there, right? But for, for as long as we have a shared destination, we can make these changes. So, so it's it's not like we have to find solutions. We have to find a shared understanding of of where we want to go, and then we can get there. Now, that's where the distortion of reality comes in, right? So, so what I just explained here, uh, I I can't finish my sentence like at the Sierra Club or at NGOs. I mean, it is way beyond what. Uh, people are willing to listen to or, or uh, willing to wrap their minds around. It's just too much, right? So how to get into pieces through this you now to understand here's where we are. We have a dysfunctional food system. You know, we, we have a, a medical system uh, that basically is a, is a sick care system. It's not a healthcare system, right? And we have vested interests that profit richly from the way it's set up and functions right now. And if anybody thinks Trump is going to fix this, that's a joke, right? I mean, because already, you know, their first fix is the, the idea is like individual responsibility. If you're obese, it's your problem. You know, if you have diabetes, it's your problem. You, you ate the wrong food and all of this thing, you know, so so that, that and that's obviously you know because you have an industry working on making food addictive and 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 it's called craveable and so that you know get the entire system is basically working against you so so that's it comes back down to this is why i'm so interested in what Yuval harari is 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 bringing to the table right now this idea of stories is viewing stories as software Thank you, Klaus. Mark. I'm a software developer. Software is not a story. It is not. Brains are not machines. Thinking is not software. This is true. Software is a system. A system is not a story. A story is not a system. They're different realities. They're different functions in the brain. Now, there's a difference between control, influence, and manipulation. A good business does not use manipulation in the communications with its employees from the top down from peer to peer, or from the bottom up. There's a big difference. Now, people need to be educated on that difference. And that education is not billions spent going to Mars. It's teachers. It's parents. It's kids who basically say, hey, you're being a bully. Stop being a bully. No, there are, I forget, um, oh, the Hawken, I forget Hawken's first name. Paul? Paul Hawken, um, did a study about NGOs and the participation that is huge in non-governmental organizations, and certainly, um, they have an influence. You know, I protested Diablo Canyon in 1981, and we've had one nuclear power plant that's been approved since then. Now, some people think that nuclear power plants are 
not cosmically irresponsible because we don't control them because they're big systems that have multiple failure points and we've seen those failures and i don't ignore those failures they fail and they fail big and you know fukushima um all the zaporizhia and the you know, wars that basically use them as leverage points to basically poison the environment for not decades not centuries now i've seen you know micro scale nuclear power plant um i just laugh it's like oh come on you know um you want to make these things safe invest in solar power invest in um geothermal invest in um what people are doing they are conserving energy because of the energy costs but then we have our friends in crypto who say well let's spend all the energy making money well that's a system it's not a story it's personal interest driving um you know Basically, energy um, needs have been pretty much flat. And that's, you know, the rise in crypto and the reduction driven by um, conservation. Well, hmm. Now, can I outlaw crypto? No. Um, are there people trying to do different kinds of crypto that doesn't take as much electricity? Um, yes, um, but I saw an interesting article that, um, you know, generation, not my generation, younger folks are basically relying on crypto to fund their retirement and, you know, they're lying flat. They're not working. Um, they're playing the market. And that's not a very productive way of running a society. Um, work is meaningful. And work gives our lives connection to other people. And if I'm just sitting at home wanking in front of a stock ticker, um, I'm not helping anybody. You've just described too large a portion of the population there, Mark. Sorry. Yeah, um, certainly uh, I'm not the king of the world, nor do I want to be. Um, but I want to push back against radical change. Um, we're not looking for change. We're looking for regulation. We're looking for stability. We're looking for um, a way of taking what exists deciding a direction together and saying, hey, let's take a first step in that direction. Is that direction good? Is that direction you know, causing harm? Let's either take a step back, take a step forward in a different direction, or keep going the way we are. I do not see in big systems people basically understanding learning and the learning of a system or understanding change. Whenever you make a change, you go from where you are, you go into chaos, and then you basically come back to a different either stability or more chaos. Change is understood. But it's not... There's a wonderful emotional graph of a home remodel, you know, and it charts the dog, it charts the kids, it charts the mom, it charts the dad. You know, when the kitchen's done, mom's happy. And, you know, and then when the garage done, you know, dad goes up and, and you know, it, uh, it charts the contractor as well. And it's, if you've ever done a home remodel or built your own home, you know, like, oh my God, you know, this is just... Um, 
a disaster not waiting to happen. It's a disaster I'm living through. And we are living through crisis after crisis. Unfortunately, a lot of these crises are crises are caused on purpose to do emotional manipulation. Now, what's the difference between influence for the good or for the bad and manipulation? Manipulation is when somebody tries to influence or control you without your assent or knowledge of it. Well, where does that assent come from? Where does that knowledge come from? It comes from education. It comes from being in community where community basically says, hey, let's take a look at these things. Um, last night was the last night um, for me um, of a uh, course at the Berkeley Alembic in transformational ritual design. And the point was made that every culture except ours, and I don't quite agree with that, um, has ritual. I think we have plenty of rituals. Um, Johnny Carson was a ritual for millions. Um, so was uh, Eric Severide or uh, Walter Cronkite. Now, um, is a technological technological solution to basically stop all the free expression on the internet and say, well, we have to listen to three networks? Oh, of course not. Um, we are in change. We are change. How do we change? Um, I happen to disagree that we need one system to rule them all. I think heterogeneous systems, yeah, let's try what Sam does, but let's try it in a sandbox. All right, let's not move the entire, you know, American voting system or UN voting system or world government or whatever we have into, you know, this one system and say, oh, okay, now we're doing this for the next 10 years. Oops, uh-oh, Unexpected consequences. Well, we knew there were going to be unexpected consequences, but we just don't know how to deal with these unexpected consequences because we didn't expect them. Um, so that's my piece. And I will basically stand on no manipulation, influence within reason. And yeah, I'm emotional. I, you know, got very, very sick. I attended nutrition, free nutrition courses um, from my um, liver disease and, and cancer. Um, am I following all those nutritional guidances? Nah, not really. Um, am I healthy now? I like to think so. Um, am I you know, trying to eat organic food? Yeah. Um, do I always manage to get, you know, oranges? Well, I got to scrub them off a lot better if they're not organic. Um, and do I think we're going to basically scale our collective decision-making before we eat the planet? Klaus, I'm sorry to say, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I really wish it will. Um, I'm doing my best to, you know, try to figure out, like many of us here, huh, how do I use my own influence to say, you know what, conserve more, recycle more, waste less, um, you know, look at your diet, look at your energy diet, look at your media diet and say, is this good for me? And is this good for the people around me? And is this good for the whole of the planet? Well, those are very difficult things to figure out, especially as an individual. But here we are in community. What are we going to do? Off to Sam. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Sam. Oh, rounding out the uh, hour and a half here. Um, <clears throat> I, just a couple things I wanted to say. I just wanted to say how much I appreciate um, Klaus's statements on how 
I'm a naturopathic physician. For those of you who don't know what that is, um, we're, we do all the regular diagnosing and prescribing of regular doctors, but we're, we don't do any major surgery. We do diet and nutrient therapies, exercise, prescription, counseling, botanical medicine, stuff like that. And the thing that our whole um, profession is the premise is based on basically is that um, for any treatment to become part of the standard of care, um, you know, so that, you know, the, the <laughs> CDC and the, well, so that the um, medical associations require that they be used um, and the CDC backs it and all that stuff, it has to go through expensive double blind placebo control trials. And the, um, the, um, in order for that to happen, the company that is going to do that trial has to expect a return on investment, the kind of return on investment that only a patentable will provide. And so um, you, see, you have the situation where no unpatentable treatment ever makes it into the standard of care. No dietary uh, therapy will ever make it into the standard of care. No exercise prescription. I mean, you have, you know, uh, activist doctors and activist hospitals doing little things here and there, but it's not going to be part of the standard of care. Why? Because of the way business medicine works. No natural hormones. All the hormones your body uses to run every single day melatonin, estro natural estrogen, never part of the standard of care. I could go on. No botanicals, no botanical extracts, even though, and there's plenty of science on these things, but it's not the pharmaceutical grade, double blind placebo, large double blind placebo control trials. So, um, you know, there, it, it's, it's now if our governments were um, really interested in protecting the interests of the people, they would invest in finding the most cost-effective, natural, safe, um, easy methods um, for dealing with, you know, interventions for specific health conditions, but they don't. Instead, what we have is a situation, and this is why I like Kennedy, because he is the only one talking about this, the regulatory capture of um, the industry. So you have a situation where um, the head of, head of the NIH or the, the directors of the NI, NAID, et cetera, they're colluding with or collaborating with uh, pharmaceutical industries um, to create patentable items because they or names are going to be on the patent and they'll get a kickback. They'll get returns on those patentable items. There's zero interest in interfering. Plus they're all in, uh, they're all from the pharmaceutical industry and they'll go back to this. It's a revolving door. There's no interest in finding, you know, that, Hey, Valerian, which you can grow in your backyard, you pull up the roots and you, you know, you, you boil it in alcohol and, you know, you could create something that, you know, um, could solve your problem of insomnia as bad as just as well as uh, diazepam, but it doesn't cause any addiction, et cetera. So, um, you know, and, and, or, or that this company has created a standardized extract. I prescribe standardized extracts all the time. There's lots of good research. It's just not gold standard research. We call it silver standard. It's great research, but it's just not enough. And even if it was, sometimes there are studies that are, you know, p powerful enough statistically to become part of the standard care, but they don't. Why? Regulators are not interested. It's just not how business and medicine works. So sorry to go on my rant, but um, the other thing I wanted to say uh, and apologize to Jose, but it's this is like this concept of leaders leading. So it's it, it boils down to this, a group of small group of people making decisions on the group on the behalf of the large group of people. And that we've always had. And the reason is because, um, you know, it doesn't scale for everybody to make decisions. Direct democracy doesn't really work that well um, in large complicated societies, but there is, and so there's always this legitimacy problem where, you know, hey, I didn't vote that for that person. I had no process in making that decision. And so the only solution that I found that solves this legitimacy problem where people can feel that they're directly um, deciding who is going to be the representative is liquid democracy. And so, um, and so um, it, it solves that legitimacy problem. Of course, there's problems with liquid democracy um, and you know, and et cetera. But um, I feel like, um, you know, for example, um, you know, there could be some instability because of the instant re recall of delegation. And um, there could be someone who who gets too much power, you know, and holds onto it for one reason or other. But those things happen in every other governmental system too. And so um, this, this one solves those problems better than other systems. So um, concentration of power, yeah, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's um, there's this direct authorization. And so you can either vote yourself or you can um, decide who, and so that's the other issue is the concentration of expertise. There has to be a system because not everybody knows everything. There has to be a system for concentrating expertise, but it has to be done in a way that's um, fluid. 
And so where you're not just somebody assigning, you know, an expert of the head of the CDC, it's where the trust of the entire, the, the trust is gauged, the entire deciding body, the entire population has its um, direct appointment, direct authorization of power um, in, and they put it, the studies have shown that they put it into people that have more knowledge than they do. So there's that ability to concentrate expertise, to empower people, but that empowerment can be removed instantly. So that's, you know, you think about leaders and all that kind of stuff. This is a way of having leadership be very fluid and based on specific challenges, specific areas of expertise, et cetera. So that's what I like about it. Um, and and re pulling back from the concept of leadership and pulling, putting into the concept of empowerment and delegation based on trust. That's what excites me. Okay, sorry, I'll jump off. Uh, Sam, thank you. Uh, I like the fact that Donald Trump is about the only major politician who's explicitly said that W lied to us to take us into the Iraq war, which I actually believe entirely, but that doesn't make me like him or trust him for everything else he does and says pretty much. And one of the reasons people follow him is that he says he's the only one who's like ballsy enough to say things like that. And they're like that. So you're making me think, has RFK Jr. been framed in my head somehow as like an idiot and a, and a, and a kook? Uh, I've, I've seen him say and do enough kooky things that I'm like, yep, I'm along for that ride. I think I think he's like dangerous for, for democracy. But I but when people do things and say things that are useful and worthwhile, how do we call those things out and help them and then stop attaching them to an, a particular individuals or platforms or whatever? I don't know. And I think liquid democracy is in fact a path to that. We might want to have, we might want to invite a couple of liquid democracy people into the room, like David Bauville, who was involved in, in creating it and see what it is and whether it's use, usable any place. Cause I'm, I'm like, Hey, how do we, how do we play? How do we role play? liquid democracy for a month and see what that does for us. I, I would like that. That'd be cool. Um, thank you. Uh, Dave, then Stacy, and then maybe Ken has a poem for us. Well, and I was just going to highlight the, the the politics is about, or democracy is about power kind of component. I mean, in this class too, it's like, I, I just don't think we're going to get to unanimity, unanimity on important issues. We're you know, we're we're 60, 40 about everything, and that's an extreme, right? We're now we're 50, 50. And to kind of expect that the uh, those guys to all switch to my side is seems a little hopeless. And so what we're really talking about is power. Who gets to decide? And you know, power is probably 52, 48, um, is my guess. Um, and so, you know, if, if Sam in your framing, you kind of said if government wanted to, right? Government doesn't exist outside of power, right? So you know, we have other methodologies. You could change the market, right? So that these things could change, but you'd have to have enough power to change the market. So things like advanced market commitments where the government says, look, we'll pay you and it will pay you for solutions to problems, right? We have a technology for it. The problem is the technology has not been implemented because of power. So we really want power, then, you know, we got to figure out ways to to, to participate in governance in such a way that our ideas win. And, and that I think implies participating in government, which I suggest most of us aren't really doing, so. Um, thank you. Stacy. Yeah, maybe I'm naive, but I when I was growing up, I always thought that the people on the Supreme Court were people that were fair, regardless of anything else. And from what I understood, they were usually agreed upon by both sides of the aisle of who was going to sit on that court. And I think what's missing is this position, is this, is the fairness built in there, some sort of authority that's based on fairness and not necessarily, not necessarily um, a body that's power, almost like a jury. Like a jury is not going to benefit from the decision that they make. Yeah, I, um, I, I just wanted to say that I think we're missing, we're missing some sort of a, objective piece that's built on fairness and objectivity and separated from the emotions of it because we just don't have that now. Thanks, Stacey. Um, I'd love to find that. That'd be that'd be a fine a fine and dandy thing. Uh, Dave, you still have your hand up, I think, from before. Uh, and Ken, welcome back to the call. Glad you had a successful trip. 
Have you found a new spot to perch on? I believe that, uh, well, we'll be working towards moving to Luca, um, which is an amazingly beautiful city. And um, we've found a lot of friends there and uh, just the paperwork and the Italian bureaucracy being to be navigated now. But um, that's the plan. So I do have a poem. This one is from William Stafford. It's called Vocation. This dream the world is having about itself includes a trace on the plains of the Oregon Trail, a groove in the grass my father showed us all one day while metalarchs were trying to tell about something better about to happen. I dreamed the trace to the mountains over the hills, and there a girl who belonged wherever she was. But then my mother called us back to the car. She was afraid. She always blamed the place, the time, anything my father planned. Now both of my parents, the long line through the plain, the metal arcs, the sky, the world's whole dream remain. And I hear him say while I stand between the two, helpless, both of them part of me, your job is to find what the world is trying to be. Thank you. Um, uh, I will be in the air next week uh, and I'm looking for somebody who would like to host the check-in call and we'll figure out how to do that, but uh, I will not be able to attend, unfortunately. Uh, and also unfortunately, because as I started this call, that'll be the first call of the new regime or our beginning understandings of the new regime. Uh, so if you would like to, if you're interested in hosting, let me know. Otherwise, uh, vote. Tell everybody in your known universe to vote. And uh, we'll see you on the inner tubes. Thanks. <laughs>